I talked this morning about the allure of a number of things in leadership, and uh, I want to focus my comments this afternoon on the allure of professionalism, strength, and impression management. And the, uh, the side of leadership uh, that I suspect many of you uh, have struggled with, and that is the messages on professionalism, the messages on strength, and the messages on impression management. And, and of course, if, if that's a new phrase to you, what I mean by impression management is simply that leadership is managing the impression you create, right? And you can usually sniff those people out pretty quickly, whether they are, in fact, just being authentic or whether they're managing an impression. And a lot of the literature, of course, helps us manage an impression. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with this session. I just want to say that up front. I think pedagogically speakers who are nervous or fearful should articulate those fears and anxieties. Um, this is our first time in New Zealand, but in the three weeks we've been here, it has a lot of rings for me uh, to the bloke culture of Australia. Uh, I know there's lots of friendly tension and bantering and competition between Australia and New Zealand, probably comparable to Canada and the United States. Uh, but I've picked up quite a bit in three weeks. I'm not an expert. As I said this morning, I come as a pilgrim on a journey rather than an expert off a plane. But I am very conscious of the fact that you were in a bloke culture. And a bloke culture, uh, as I've understood it, and I've picked this up a lot in Australia because we've made many trips there, uh, creates an environment for leadership that uh, has a lot of ripple effects that I think are problematic. Uh, one of them being that there's very little in the bloke culture that bears any resemblance to biblical understanding. Um, uh, I like sports, so I'm not against the all blacks or anything, so don't, you know, categorize me. But the bloke culture communicates a lot of messages about what it means to be a leader, and more fundamentally, what it means to be male. And then, of course, by implication, what it means to be female. And so I think one of the things that you uh, as a culture need to deal with and uh, grapple with and struggle with is what it means to be in a bloke culture. Now, when you have a bloke culture, the influence on the church and the influence on church leadership is pretty profound uh, and often subtle and not picked up all the time. So I'm going to speak this afternoon as a male. It's really my only option <laughs> for, ob for obvious reasons. I, there, this is not a multiple choice test. I can only speak as a male. Um, but I am concerned because I think what I'm going to do this afternoon is not very blokish. Uh, I don't know if that's a word, but I've just made it up. Uh, because I want to talk about uh, pain in my own life uh, as we park in the town of pain. Those of you who are not here this morning, uh, you'll see the map on the first page. And we are now parking in the town of pain. And I want to spend the whole time in the town of pain today and really uh, take what Joe led us into, which is to talk about story and just tell my story. Uh, do remember that biography is not offered um, to be evaluated. Uh, biography is simply somebody's story. And so I'm not offering you this uh, so you can evaluate the story. What I'm offering it to you is in the spirit of self-disclosure, not exhibitionism. And for the young pastors here, please remember the distinction. Self-disclosure is for the benefit of the other. Exhibitionism is because you have a need to tell. Right? And we've all been in those sermons where the, person, you know, the pastor's up the front saying, I just had a, you know, I had a fight with my husband on the way here before and with my three children. You think, you get back to Scripture. I don't want to hear about your fight. Uh, it's kind of, you have a need to tell the story. Uh, you're not really trying to help others. And so I tell this in the spirit of self-disclosure uh, to try to help you grapple uh, for yourself with what it means to have a Jessica story. Now, I call it a Jessica story and not call it the story about Jessica because for me this is metaphorical. And as you listen to my story and listen to my interaction with the story, I'm not expecting you either to feel like, you know, I don't have anything as bad as that or I don't have anything as good as that or, or you know, be comparing it. But actually think about pain and struggle in your own life and then try to integrate that in to your understanding of how this affects your leadership along the lines of how we finish this morning. So, the Jessica story. It's hard for me to speak briefly about this because this has been uh, a 35-year journey, and so I'm going to summarize it in a very brief period of time. Uh, when we got married, we approached uh, having children the same way most Christian couples approach having children. We decided we'd wait for a few years, um, and then we would have children. And so we waited for a few years, and we decided to have children. And of course, people with infertility know that children don't come from sexual intercourse. They come from God. 
Um, and uh, we realized about a year into the trying period that we weren't being blessed with biological children. Went to the physicians and were diagnosed with infertility. And any of you who've struggled with infertility or know people who have will know that you very much feel there's a big eye on your forehead, uh, that you're lacking something. Uh, Mother's days are brutal in church. Father's days are brutal in church. And um, although I've never experienced the menstrual cycle directly, the menstrual cycle, uh, which ultimately comes in the way God created women, is a monthly reminder of grief and pain and loss. Uh, the monthly cycle is very, very difficult when you're struggling with infertility because you can't move on every month you're reminded again that this is not happening. And you mourn the loss of something you never had, which I think is the most painful form of grief, to actually mourn the loss of something that you never had. Uh, that went on for a number of years for us until we reached about 35. We were praying, we recognized children were a gift from God. Uh, now I'm hoping that God realizes that prayer about the infertility was for back then, not for now. Uh, the Abraham and Sarah story, frankly, spooks me a little bit at this point in time uh, to think, you know, what if God ever blessed us with a biological child right now? It would be a bit frightening. Um, I was a little bit against adoption because I had a blokish uh, streak to me and thought that, you know, children were about my sexual prowess, uh, which is a bit embarrassing to say publicly, but that was truthful. Uh, somehow not having a child, it was like impotence or something, which is a word that's used in infertility. Um, but just to not to be able to produce something. And I was a person, I grew up in the Wilson house, and in the Wilson house, when there's challenges, you throw hard work at it. Uh, you make it happen. We make things happen in our family. So to not have children was quite, a, was quite a, uh, a, a strange blow to my sense of being able to do things and make things happen. I got a phone call 25 years ago from a person who did not uh, know very much about us, didn't know whether we had children, didn't know anything about infertility, had never met Bev, uh, knew me a little bit, and said this, and I quote, In the United States, there's a single Christian teenage girl who's pregnant. She's pregnant out of wedlock. This other person is praying about her situation, and every time this person prays, the name Rod Wilson comes to mind. Does this mean anything to you? <sighs> I will never forget that phone call as long as I live. Uh, it was a jolting experience. Bev was working in the inner city at that point with street kids, and of course, any of you who've worked with street kids will know they just walk down the street and get pregnant. It's almost like they don't need sex in order to get pregnant. And so she was watching the kids she was working with get pregnant all the time. We're battling, and we're doing the, you know, why do bad things happen to good people, a la Harold Krishner. Um, and this phone call comes. So I went upstairs, and I guess I looked like I saw a ghost, the Holy Ghost. And um, sometimes the King James is right. Um, and I, I had this experience of just looking, you know, white as a sheet. And I told Bev the story. And she said, well, that's really interesting because all the way home today from the, the inner city, I've been praying about your attitude towards adoption. And those of us with theological training have learned about the sovereignty of God. And the sovereignty of God is a great, big, you know, complex theological subject. But this was like the sovereignty of God coming right into our lives. And I felt this theological claustrophobia that God was speaking to us. And it, and it went from maybe God isn't good to God is good. So we went and were interviewed by this 18 or 19-year-old who only knew how to have sex, didn't know much else. I'm doing something inappropriate here. What am I doing? Uh, am I banging this? It's my tie, right? Dear, is it this? Okay, let me put this up here. My leash, because I can stay close to the podium. Okay, so uh, we went and were interviewed. She knew how to have sex, but she was interviewing us, our, the 35-year-olds, about whether we could parent her child. She agreed we could. She wanted us at the delivery, so we went to the delivery. It's the worst night of my life. Um, I think I've come close to giving up my faith once or twice, and that was the one. Um, we were in the delivery room, uh, her mother was there, the pregnant teenager, Bev and myself, uh, I had my smelling salts to get through the occasion, and um, it was a really horrific experience. Um, it was a vaginal delivery, they couldn't get her out, uh, there was a lot of concern, she eventually came out, her head was the size of an eight-month-old child, huge head. The eyes were rolled down, so there was no, all you could see was the white of the eye. You couldn't see any color. There was no sound. You know, I was waiting for the crying. There was no sound at all. It was deathly quiet. They rushed her away. They put her in a room. 
down the hall with these little blinds that were sort of half open and we looked in the room and all these wires were coming out of her and everything and then they put her in an ambulance and took her away to another city. And we went to bed and I frankly didn't want to wake up. Um, that's how I felt. It just felt really cruel, really, really cruel. Like why would God, you know, make, have this phone call made out of the blue and then this would happen. They didn't know all that was wrong with her and she had neurosurgery but four days later that didn't work. She had neurosurgery another eight days after that. She was in intensive care for three weeks and then, the, then they stopped the adoption and said um, like if, if you're going to adopt this child uh, she's probably going to be disabled. Uh, do you want to adopt her? And we just felt that phone call. We, um, we had to adopt her. There was no choice. We wanted to. It was God's gift, quote unquote. And it's been awful for 25 years. Uh, first awful for her. She's probably been in a hospital 35 or 40 times. Um, she, um, she started puberty when she was two. Uh, had a breast growing, was starting early signs of menstrual cycle when she was two. She has frontal lobe damage of the brain, so uh, her impulse control is really poor. She's been quite violent a lot of her life. Um, she can't learn from consequences, so there's a disconnect between behavior and consequences. Because this is taped, I'm not going to give all the details on this, but we've been physically assaulted a lot. And um, she's lived in every form of chaos you can imagine. Um, brutal for her, brutal for us. Just really, really awful. A lot of good things, a lot of enjoyable things, a lot of good parts of the story. Some really hard parts of the story, too. You know, I'm 60 now. Most of my peers um, have grandchildren, and, you know, it's kind of the new marketing for people, right? You know, I have grandchildren. Sort of that means something. Um, we've had one grandchild uh, who was aborted, and uh, Bev was there and saw our first grandchild in nine little pieces. Um, so that's the Jessica story. And I'm not saying this to be dramatic. I just want to be honest with you today. Um, we came really close to canceling this trip because on Ash Wednesday, uh, we were in a, an armed standoff with the police. Um, she hangs out with pretty unhealthy people, and Joe's been threatening to shoot her for a number of months. And uh, it culminated on Ash Wednesday when um, the police were called, and the police arrived at one end of the neighborhood and blocked that side off and blocked off to the other side of the neighborhood, got her out, but they didn't get him. So they strategized and got all their guns, and we were on the outside of the barrier. And I just, I, I will never forget that night standing there on Ash Wednesday. I, I decided the previous day I was going to give up dessert for Lent, <laughs> um, which, you know, for me is a big deal. That's a pretty major sacrifice. But, uh, you know, I, I was just standing there thinking, this is, this is bizarre. Like, it's so, here, I've seen this stuff on movies. I've watched it on films, but I'm standing behind this police barricade, and they're strategizing how to get at this guy, and they're afraid he's going to shoot them. And I'm afraid he's going to shoot Jessica or shoot us. So they eventually got him and arrested him, and the police said that he was a threat to us and our lives, and he was a threat to Jessica, so he needed to be kept in jail. But the lawyers decided differently, so he was let out. So he's out now. And Jessica's in our home, which she hasn't been in for nine years. And uh, we're nervous we're going to be shot, or she's going to be shot. And we went through this thing before coming on this trip of saying, um, like, what do we do? Like, uh, do you come on the trip and, and risk that he may shoot her? Um, do you stay and risk that he may shoot us and shoot her? Um, you know, theolo theological training doesn't prepare you for this, right? I don't know what the answer is to that. We just thought, you know what? We need to come. We need to come to New Zealand and do what we're going to do there and trust that God will look after us. And, you know, we... Uh, talk to some of our friends and say, you know, they used to pray for their teenage kids. They come home on time from the youth group, and then they met us. <laughs> and kind of their prayers are a little different now, and ours are different too. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but there is a chance when we go home we could be killed. And um, then I go into the office, and when I'm in the office, um, as I walk into my office at Regent, there's a sort of a plaque thing outside my door that says Office of the President Rod Wilson. And most days I laugh when I see that. 
literally out loud. I find it hilarious. I've gone into that office with bruises on my body, and I'm the president of Regent College, you know? Tell my friends I'm J.I. Packer's boss, you know, it's just kind of fun. <laughs> um, but I don't feel strong, and I don't feel internally at all that um, I have what it takes to be a leader. I don't. I, I just, I feel really frail. You know, and I articulate well, and ideas flow together well, and I'm pretty organized in my thoughts and all the rest of it. So, you know, you know I sound like I'm competent, but I don't feel very competent at all. And I think the thing that's been hardest for me with the Jessica story is this sense of that it's been an interruption to my leadership, that I just want it to stop. And I remember a very, there's many painful days, but one of the most painful for me, we're in the car, and I don't even remember what happened, but I just started pounding the top of the car. Stop, 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 stop. Pounding the car. And you know, having, my hand was just an agony for days and days and days after. I just was so broken with this. And how do you put together your Jessica story with being a leadership? Like, how do you do this? So, I guess what I want to suggest to you is not, um, you know, you've got to have a Jessica story like mine or, you, you know, your struggles have to be the same as my struggles. I'm not suggesting that at all. But my hunch is if everyone in this room stood up and said, um, you know, here's my story, <laughs> it wouldn't all be sweetness and light, right? It'd be pretty painful. There's a lot of painful, even, you know, I've just been around here the last few days, there's a lot of painful stories in this room, and I know that. Um, but we're in leadership. So how do you put these together without ignoring it? And as, a, as you know, I'm not a bloke, but I am male, and males, particularly Western males, have been enculturated in certain ways. Like, part of me doesn't want to have this, thank you very much. Like, just get healed already. And some of my charismatic friends, you know, are talking about, you know, what about healing? And my answer to that is a very straightforward one. Her disability has healed Bev and me in lots of ways. Powerful, powerful impact in our lives. But how do I deal with leadership? And so what I want to share with you just briefly and, and biographically is just some of my reflections on this. And, you know, steal what you want, take what you want, apply it to your own Jessica story. This is straight biography. I'm not giving you concepts now. I'm just giving you what I've dealt with. And I'm sure not there, but I think I'm on the right road. And that's important, as we said this morning. I want to be on the right road. I don't want to be there, but I want to be on the way. Now, one of the things that I picked up is, as a leader, I need to be a professional. And you know what professionals are characterized by and what they look like and everything. There's an appearance, there's an aura, there's a way of being. You know, to be a leader, uh, you're supposed to be a certain way. And so I need to be a professional. But let's look uh, briefly at the sociology of professions. Uh, some of you have studied this area. Uh, what is a profession? Well, one of the ways to talk about a profession is to say a profession is something that's defined by a common body of knowledge and skills. So when I go to my dentist, I assume when she says open your mouth and sticks the drill in, that she knows what she's doing, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be opening my mouth. And lurking behind her is a body of knowledge and skills. That's why she's called a professional. But my question in leadership is, what is the appropriate body of knowledge and skills when it comes to Christian leadership? What is it I need to know? Like, I get the dentists are professionals, and I get the doctors are professionals. I understand that really well. What does it mean to be a leader and be a professional? What is the common body of knowledge and skills? And there's so many books, and so many conferences, and so many workshops, and so many suggestions, and so many gurus, I just get lost. I, I don't know. Like, what is the common body of knowledge and skills I need to know? And do I have to know it all before I exert any leadership? That's one orientation. The second one is the power approach. That leadership, or professional leadership, is an assertion of power, social advantage, and earning capacity. Right? And you know about the power thing. Uh, like when I go in, um, you know, last time I went for my physical, this woman who's a little bit younger than I am, she has a white coat on, she comes into the room and she says, take your clothes off. Now, if any other woman came up to me and said, take your clothes off, that wasn't my wife, I'd, you know, I'd probably do the Joseph thing. And, Leave my cloak and get out of there, right? I mean, that's the appropriate response. But because she has a white coat on and says, take your clothes off, I do exactly what she says. I take my clothes off. Because uh, that's what you do. She has power over me. And she has social advantage. And the doctor has earning capacity. Most doctors make more than most presidents of theological schools do. Will come as a surprise to most of you. 
In order to be a professional, of course, of this sort, you need to have uncertainty and mastery and vulnerability. So I'm pretty vulnerable. I'm sitting there in my underwear, and she's asked me to do something, and I've done it. I'm pretty vulnerable because she has power. That's what a professional is when they have power. How does that apply to Christian leadership? Does that mean in order to be a professional leader, I need to have a vulnerable group that has no power? And I want to stop there and tell you some stories from churches that I've been in and Christian organizations I've been in, and that's exactly what leadership is. Leadership is one person, usually male, usually white, usually with the right smile and the right look on their teeth, is in fact the power person, and everyone else is vulnerable, and they're a professional leader. The third one is the functionalist approach. And this, of course, is the notion, it's kind of a sociological critique, that the reason we have professionals is because family and community has disappeared, and we, and we get professionals to do things that we can't do for ourselves anymore. I do a lecture on this thing called caring professions. It's an interesting set of terms, caring professions. I was telling the counseling students the other day, the worst, uh, the worst question you can ever be asked as a counselor is somebody looks you in the eye and says, would you be caring for me if I wasn't paying you? You say, well, tell me more about that. What do you mean? You're right? Um, and of course, those of you in pastoral ministry know tell me more is the best phrase to use when you have no clue what you want to say. <laughs> Professionals sometimes replace things that we could do for ourselves. So in what way do privatization and specialization and urbanization create a culture for the proliferation of leadership literature? I think one of the reasons that we have so much leadership literature now and so much emphasis on leadership is because the culture around the world is becoming more privatized, more specialized, and more urbanized. And when you get into a privatized, urbanized, specialized culture, then people immediately create people at the top of the power uh, pyramid, and then there's people who are disadvantaged and without power. So what kind of a professional am I going to be with my Jessica story? I love Parker Palmer in his book, The Act of Life. He says this, and you have the quote in front of you for those of you who have the words, or the notes, rather. As professionals, we like to define ourselves in ways that stress competence, high standards, an ethic of service, personal sacrifice, and so on. A professional is a person who has invested long hours and much money to develop an allegedly rare ability that others can be convinced to need and to purchase at a high price. In fact... The full-fledged professional has the power and sometimes the necessity to extend the world of objects even further to make objects of other people. At root, in contrast, a professional is one who makes a profession of faith. Faith in something larger and wiser than his or her own powers. The true professional is a person whose action points beyond his or herself to that underlying reality, that hidden wholeness, on which we all can rely. Now, you see what this Quaker writer is saying to us, that when we're a professional, what are we actually doing? Let me just draw this in the air for you. A professional is somebody who stands here and says, I want to profess something that's behind me, that's part of my backdrop, part of my foundation. So when I talk to you about faith in Jesus as a leader, what I talked to you about this morning, I'm not talking about that conceptually. I'm saying that part of my life with Jessica has learned that there is something behind me, an underlying reality, a hidden wholeness on which I can rely, and out of that I speak. The brokenness that I lean into is, in fact, the backdrop for me to be able to talk about the gospel. Now, it doesn't mean you have to talk about the Jessica story all the time. This is not an applied theology course where we're talking about what do you share in a sermon, what don't you share in a sermon, what do you share in counseling, what don't you share in counseling. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying in my own mindset, I want to be professional in the sense that I'm professing something that is behind me that I lean into. And when I do that, I'm being a professional of a certain sort. I'm not falling into the sociology of professions that we talked about earlier. Another way to conceptualize professions, of course, is professionals are those who are paid and amateurs are those who are not paid. It's the great debate in the Olympics. Should Olympic athletes be paid? Should they not be paid? And those of you who know your Latin will remember what does amateur mean? Doing it for love. And so part of having brokenness and part of experiencing the love of God in the brokenness is then to act out of that and be an amateur leader. Doing it for love. The love of the other, 
and the love of God because of the experience of God in the brokenness. Competence and professionalism do tie together, but with a certain definition. Secondly, if I am a competent leader, I won't have limitations. Now, I talked a little bit about the Wilson, uh, being born a Wilson. Uh, there's three, three uh, siblings in the family. We have 10 degrees between us. Uh, all of us are in very strong roles, the three siblings. My mother worked until she was 80, full time, and only stopped work because the company went out of business, not because she quit. And when they reassembled and decided to operate on a new name, they came back to her and asked her if she'd like to return. And we used to have these conversations on the phone. My 82-year-old mother was whether she would go back to work full time or not. My father retired when he was 65, started his own business, had a heart attack, was told not to go back to work, went back to work, had another heart attack, was told not to go back to work, went back to work, had another heart attack, and died. Okay? So that's my genetic predisposition, right? Up until recently, I couldn't even spell Sabbath. Um, because the whole wiring is throw work at it, be diligent, be conscientious. And of course, in the evangelical world, you get lots of accolades for that, right? People applaud when you overwork. Workaholism is one of the few vices that Christians cheer about, right? Most of us, most vices, we, we were critical, but workaholism in the church, we cheer about. And so I have huge uh, limitations that um, if something happens that I can't throw work at and be conscientious and make things happen, it throws me. So for a Wilson to experience infertility, this is a huge problem, a huge problem. What? Not being able to have a child? Like something's amiss. So we tried everything. When we're old and we won't be embarrassed anymore, we're going to write a book on all the things we tried. It'd be too embarrassing to say it publicly. But um, some of them were shared by people after the morning service, actually. And it's amazing what people want to talk about when they know you've got the I word. The strength is diligence and conscientiousness. The weakness is the belief that diligence always accomplishes God's work in the world and that the kingdom is dependent on conscientiousness. And when we fall into the trap, and those of you who are Wilsons in the group, you know who you are. We probably go back to the same parents somewhere along the line. Uh, the Wilsons in the room know that one of the great curses of diligence is that it can subtly make you question the sovereignty of God. Very subtly, not explicitly, not in your explicit theology, but your implicit theology that somehow your hard work can make things better. And so I'm aware of lots of limitations in my leadership, and some of them have come from the infertility story and the Jessica story. And when I realize in the Jessica story and the infertility story, I can't throw work at it. I can't do things to make Jessica's brain damage go away. I can't do things to make her high-functioning autism go away. I can't do things to make her endocrinology problems go away that came from starting puberty at two. I can't do that. And that's hard for me. But listen to what, what Parker Palmer says in his book, Let Your Life Speak. Limitations and liabilities are the flip side of our gifts. A particular weakness is the inevitable trade-off for a particular strength. We will become better not by trying to fill the potholes in our souls, but by knowing them so well that we can avoid falling into them. Now you see this model, it's not the model of what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses? It's a model that says, I have some qualities that often display my strength and my weakness all at the same time. Conscientiousness is not inherently right or inherently wrong. It depends. And what my weakness and my frailty and my Jessica story has shown me is the very thing that I'm strongest at has, in fact, become my Achilles heel. And if you interviewed me when I was training to be a psychologist many years ago and said to me, what's the first group of people you worked with clinically in a hospital when you were training? Autistic children who were disabled. That's hard. Now I have one. She's my own. And I'm her dad. And I can't pull the professional thing. And now I feel frail and weak. And my conscientiousness doesn't work. And so then when I read the scriptures, I'm really impacted now by passages like Mark chapter 4, the, par the parable of the, of the uh, seed, not the soil, the parable of the seed. Farmer scatters the seed in the ground, then what does he do? Absolutely nothing. Let me repeat that for those of you who are dozing. Farmer scatters the seed on the ground, after that what does he do? Absolutely nothing. 
passage is clear. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed grows. And then that lovely Greek word from which we get the word automatic, the seed grows all by itself. He doesn't even know how it grows. He couldn't put a video series together on this if he wanted to. He doesn't know how it grows. It just grows. And when he realizes it grows on its own, he realizes that his responsibility is to scatter the seed, but he can't make it grow. Imagine running into an orchard field and yelling at the trees to produce apples. That sounds bizarre, but can I suggest to you that some of us in pastor ministry do that on a regular basis? We're not scattering seed. We're screaming at the trees to make the apples come out. It doesn't work. That's God's business. It's not ours. And so my, my strength in being diligent and conscientious is, in fact, my, my weakness, my limitation. And I only learned that because Jessica is my daughter. Number three, if I'm competent leader, I won't suffer. Now, this is a huge one for me. Suffering is interruption. Suffering is getting in the way of my life. Make this stop. Make it go away. Somehow suffering is not part of what it means to be a Christian. Many of you have read Henri Nouwen, a uh, great contributor to things of the kingdom. And in his little book, The Wounded Healer, he says this, and there's no inclusive language in this. This applies to men and to women. But listen to what he says. Our fragmented life experiences combined with our sense of urgency do not allow for a handbook for ministers. Right? That's what I was saying earlier. There's no 22 steps for how to be a pastor. After all attempts to articulate the predicament of modern man, the necessity to articulate the predicament of the minister himself became most important. For the minister is called to recognize the sufferings of his time in his own heart and make that recognition the starting point of his service. Whether he tries to enter into a dislocated world, relate to a convulsive generation, or speak to a dying man, his service will not be perceived as authentic unless it comes from a heart wounded by the suffering about which he speaks. Now what's now in saying? Now it is saying very clearly that when we're talking about pain and suffering out there, and how many times do we do this as Christian ministers? Often when we're together as Christians, we talk about the out there. Like out there, they're in pain. They're not in pain. Many of them look perfectly happy. They're not all in pain because they don't have Jesus. They're quite fine, thank you very much. But we project that out there. We said they have pain out there. Or then sometimes we get behind wood. Now, some people are very dangerous when they get behind wood on a Sunday morning. Then sometimes we get behind wood and we make statements about you out there who are in pain. And now it says, no, 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 no. Don't start out there. Don't start out there. Start in here. And when you experience your own wounds, then you understand the true nature of the incarnation. And what is the true nature of the incarnation? A suffering servant. Right? A suffering servant. Not a professional macho man. A suffering servant who died on a cross and whose friends deserted him, who was totally misunderstood by many people, who walked here in brokenness and frailty and experienced all the things we experienced yet without sin. That's the person we follow. And in following Jesus, you recognize that there's something in your own heart that you respond out of. So when Joe was talking this morning, very, I thought, helpfully and appropriately about homosexuality, um, and I've heard speakers talk about abortion. You know, and I'm an evangelical. I've got a pretty orthodox perspective on both these topics. And it's very easy for me to talk about out there about homosexuality and abortion. Or it's very easy for me to talk out there about homosexuality and abortion. But I'm here to tell you that my daughter got pregnant in a relationship with a bisexual guy and had an abortion. So I don't talk about abortion and homosexuality in this sort of, oh my goodness, attitude. It hasn't changed my theology, but I carry it very differently because I've experienced the wound. In British Columbia, one person is allowed to come into an abortion. And when Bev came home from that abortion, and as somebody who's into the arts, she draws well, and she drew the picture of our first grandchild in nine little pieces. That was overwhelming. And so I'm still opposed to abortion, still not a fan of abortion at all, but it's very different when I feel wounded by abortion than when I talk about abortion ideologically out there or in the world of the non-Christian or even in the world of the pew. This is my own experience. And because of that experience, I come with a sense of woundedness. And in my woundedness, I seek to bring healing. 
not in my perfection, not that I've got it all together, and I'm going to help you in this sort of paternalistic way. You poor people of pain, let me help you because I don't have any. No, I am in pain. I wouldn't tell the Jessica story on a Sunday morning. I don't mind telling it here. I wouldn't tell it on a Sunday morning. But when I tell it, I tell it with the recognition that there's a spirit in which I carry the pain inside that influences how I need to respond to the pain of others. Number four, if I'm a competent leader, I won't be vulnerable. My colleague at Region College, Maxine Hancock, uh, has this lovely line, which I like. She says, the greater, the greater strength we have in some area of human excellence, intellect, beauty, physical strength, the harder it is to embrace the reality of our vulnerability, which is a condition of being human. Vulnerability. I could stop and talk about the, the bloke culture a lot on this one. Because, of course, the big problem with the bloke culture, both in this country and in Australia, is the lack of vulnerability that comes with the bloke culture. Because the aura of the bloke culture is not to have vulnerability. I don't know all the names of the players on the All Blacks, but my hunch is when people think of the All Blacks, they don't think vulnerability. That wouldn't be the first thing that comes to mind, right? My hunch is if you're a vulnerable All Black, you probably won't make the team more than likely, right? That's not the aura of being a good rugby player. It's not what it's about. But what we need to recognize, and those of us in leadership need to recognize this, is we often have strengths and gifts and abilities, and we get a little bit consumed with our own press conference. Right? We get a little bit consumed with our own press conference. We realize we have some strengths. I spend my life talking to groups. I'm always talking to groups, all the time, all over the world. And so I think, you know, I'm a speaker that gets on airplanes and talks to all sorts of people about all sorts of topics. And I think, well, that's who I am. That's, well, I'm Rod. I'm a speaker who talks to all kinds of people all the time. No, I'm not. I am not Rod who gets on planes and talks to speakers all the time. I'm Rod who for 25 years have said to Bev over and over again, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. I just don't know what to say. When we got home from that incident six or eight weeks ago, after being in that armed standoff, I just went home and said, I, like, I don't know what to say. And isn't that an interesting contrast? Somebody who, whose tongue is his major tool in his ministry doesn't know what to say. And the danger for those of us who speak and preach and teach and we're proclaiming verbally up front all the time, whatever context you do that in, the danger is that we get lulled into the belief that this is who we are. And it's not who I am. I am not a person who speaks all the time, who puts things together well and it flows out well. I'm not umming and awing and all that kind of stuff. I, that's, not who, that's not who I am. That's who I appear. But I'm also a person who back here is banging the top of the car and going, I don't know what to say. I'm a speaker who's speechless. And my hunch is, in this room, with many of you in this room, spouses, whatever it might be, there's many of you in this room who have an issue in your life that makes you speechless, but the call in your life is to be a speaker. And therein lies vulnerability, the recognition that we haven't got it together. Number five, if I'm competent, I won't feel weak. I remember when I was younger, and I've, I've had a lot of leadership roles since I was young, but when I was younger, I used to think that when you're a leader, you feel the same way you appear, right? So we just did graduation at Region. You know, there's a 1,000 people out there, and I'm presiding over the gathering, and I've got all these, you know, I've got a great suit on and my academic gown, and I'm, you know, doing my thing, welcoming all the people and hooding all the students, and, you know, it looks really, really strong. But I'm feeling incredibly weak. Now, this feeling that in the observable we're strong, but in the unobservable we're weak. I remember two weeks ago standing up and, you know, presiding over convocation. But within hours of that, I was on the street looking up and down the street to see if Joe was there with a gun. And the juxtaposition of that for me was just so startling. Like, here I am presiding over Region College's convocation. You know, it's a big deal. And I look strong, and the whole thing's strong. And I've, you know, I've got the power invested in me by the Board of Governors to hood all these students and all the rest of it. And I'm worried I'm going to be shot. I feel so weak. And for me, for many years, the, the, the link of those two was not appropriate. That's just not right. I cannot have these two things together. I can't be weak 
and be strong. It's either or. And of course, you know, if you've been around the Christian life, most of our problems in life is because we've got too many either ors and not enough both ands, right? That's why we have so much trouble in many areas. So I love 2 Corinthians 12. And you know the passage, the thorn in the flesh. And I find some humor in that passage. You know, we know from the passage that Paul's had this problem for 14 years, and he says, three times I asked the Lord to take it away, and I'm going, come on, three times in 14 years? Like, what? You can't be serious. Like, four and a third? Every four and a third years, you say, take it away? Okay, <laughs> see in four years? Like, I don't, I don't know. It's probably some, you know, we got a New Testament prof. We should get him to exegete that. But anyway, um, so he comes three times. Says, That's what the text says. I think there's a typo in there or something, or a redaction criticism. I don't know what's going on there. But anyway, comes, says, take it away, take it away, take it away. And, you know, sometimes people come, we tell our Jessica story, they say, have you ever asked God to, to heal her? No, no, I haven't thought of that. Thanks for sharing, actually. Um, no. Wow, what a, what a unique perspective. Uh, you know, so like, give your head a shake. You can't be serious. Like, um, you know, we've been in a coma for 20 years. No, I haven't thought of this. Um, so have we asked God to take it away? Absolutely, we have. And his answer to us, very clearly, has been caught in that verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 12 in front of you there. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. Right? Grace isn't the way to get in the door. It's the way to function when you're in the room. Right? Those of you with good fundamentalist evangelical background, please remember that. Grace is not the way to get in the door. It's how you function when you're in the room. Too much singing of amazing grace about conversion, not enough singing about amazing grace post-conversion. Have you noticed that? Sometimes there's this grace thing to get in, and then once you're in, everyone's forgot how to spell it, much less use it and operate with it. My grace is sufficient. The fact that some of us in this room have problems and difficulties that God hasn't healed is not an indication of his absence. It's often an indication of his presence, right? It's not absence. The fact that you have problems that are going on and you've got some friends who say, you know, I wasn't God healed you, you must be unspiritual or this or that. Some of us are carrying things to the grave because God's grace is sufficient. That's what it's about. It's not about he's, he's weak because he hasn't healed or we don't have faith because it, because it hasn't been healed. His grace is sufficient. Now, why is his grace sufficient? Look at that next phrase. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, that doesn't need exegesis. If you can read English, you know what he just said. My power is made perfect in weakness. Power is not predicated on the removal of weakness. It's actually predicated on the presence of weakness. And I'm not anti-charismatic. We go to a church with a strong charismatic feel to it, so don't hear this, my charismatic friends. Please remember that healing that asserts that weakness requires strength to get rid of the weakness is not biblical healing. You don't need to get rid of weakness. Often, it's in the weakness the strength comes. And that's what this passage clearly teaches. And then Paul says, these kind of odd phrases, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And if I can draw this in the air for you, this is the lesson that I've learned from this passage, and 2 Corinthians has become my favorite book for this reason. Many of us think this is the Christian life. Here's weakness, here's strength. And so life is trying to run away from weakness. Run, 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 right up here. And then we get almost there, and then we go, oh, and then we're back here. And then we run, 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 got to be weak, got to be weak, got to, and then we dress it up with these phrases like victorious Christian living. And that's a favorite around the world. Everyone wants to, victorious Christian living. And that's like right about here, you know, it's victorious Christian living. And then it's like, eh, you know, you're not, I don't know what the opposite of victorious Christian living is, but I didn't know there was an opposite. Um, and then you're up and down, you know, oh, I'm almost living in victorious Christian life, and then you're back, back, back like this. That is so evangelical, but deeply unbiblical. It's deeply unbiblical. Let me draw it for you simply in the air. The Christian life is not framed by leaving weakness to go to strength. The Christian life is, in weakness, I experience strength. Because it's about Jesus. Amen. Right? That's what it's about. I find power in Christ. Amen. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So it's not this, it's this. And when you live this way, you're in constant frustration because you're not living like a victorious Christian life. And you're feeling, oh, I'm back here, I got weakness. Oh, the Jessica, oh, the Jessica story's getting better. She's doing really well. Oh, something happened. Mm, back here, I feel so weak and dependent again. Oh, now I feel strong. Oh, now I feel weak. 
And one of the reasons Christians are exhausted is not because of burnout, because they don't understand the Christian life. It's not a sprint away from weakness into strength. It's a recognition that in weakness, I am strong because of who Christ is. And that has been a profound lesson for me to realize that even Wilsons, even Wilsons may have to live with ongoing weakness and ongoing feeling of weakness in order for Christ's power to be manifested. That's huge. And the Wilsons of the room, you get that. I can see your faces. The, the non-Wilsons are going, well, you know, these Wilsons, you know, they're always so conscientious. But, you know, we'll pray for you. But, but those of us who are Wilsons, we get that, right? This feeling of weakness is a requirement in order to experience Christ's strength and Christ's power. Let me just say here at the end uh, of this point, I know I'm a tiny bit over time, but we started late. Um, this is one of the problems with the bloke culture. Because the bloke culture, by definition, does not allow for weakness. And this is why throughout the world, people, men between 45 and 65 are often deeply immature, deeply uncommitted to the core of the Christian faith, and are unable to serve well. Because what they do is spend their life trying to fight weakness and be, pretend they're strong. They do it with sarcasm. They do it with sports images. They do it with chauvinism. They do it with very hard and critical attitudes in the church. And in the process, they develop a persona that is strong. But then you go to a senior's facility, and what do you find? It's filled with women, and all the men have died. So the men spend most of their life trying to fight, fight weakness. And then in Western culture, most of them will die somewhere between four to seven years sooner than the women will. It's sort of amusing to me that as men, when we are born, we're very dependent. We're very reliant on others. We know we can't function on our own. That's not even part of our consciousness. Then we spend the rest of our lives trying to stand on our own two feet and be strong. And then we die. There's something about that that's disturbing, about bloke culture. How does one follow the gospel if you're constantly fighting weakness? Number six, if I'm competent, I won't show my true self. If I'm competent, I won't show my true self. There's a little part of me, even though I'm very committed to this orientation, to this biblical theological orientation, there's a little part of me, and this happened to me again this morning as I was going through my notes after I got up, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure I want to do this. Like, I'm not sure I want to give this section the way I'm going to give it. I knew I was going to do it this way, but I thought, no, let's just deal with, you know, the concepts, you know, the concepts. Let's deal with the concepts, the theology, the Bible. Because if I, if I show them what I'm really like, like if I say President Regent College bisexual, those of you who came in late, there's a context for that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay? Or if I say, you know, President of Regent College abortion, or I say President of Regent College being shot, it's like, um, I, I, I just think I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to show that, thanks very much. I, let's just say, let's stay with the disembodied concepts. My favorite Parker Palmer line, how did so many disembodied concepts emerge from a tradition whose central commitment is the word become flesh? How did so many disembodied concepts emerge from a tradition whose central tenet is the word become flesh? We live in the Christian life in an embodied orientation. Jesus didn't come and give sermons. Jesus didn't come and give theology. God didn't yell down concepts and ideas. He sent it in flesh, in a body. It's biographical. It's who we are. It's all we have to offer. And so even though I feel like competence, coming, you know, you fly across the ocean, you come to New Zealand, you do a conference on leadership, I should be competent. And I shouldn't show my true self. But I love Parker Palmer in A Hidden Wholeness when he says this. You can tell I love Parker Palmer. Quakers are great writers on these subjects. Listen to what he says. Thomas Merton claimed that there's in all things a hidden wholeness. But back in the human world, where we are less self-revealing than Jack Pines, Merton's words can at times sound like wishful thinking. Afraid that our inner life will be extinguished, our inner darkness exposed, we hide our true identities from each other. In the process, we become separated from our own souls. We end up living divided lives so far removed from the truth we hold within 
that we cannot know the integrity that comes from being what you are. Now listen to these two sentences. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Knowing this gives me hope that human wholeness, mine, yours, and ours, need not be a utopian dream if we can use devastation as a seedbed for new life. I've got lots of training, lots of degrees, lots of theological training. I'm the president of a theological institution. But I'm here to tell you, as I mentioned this morning, that my learning about the gospel has come almost exclusively from Jessica and my experience with Jessica, not from all the other things I've done. Why? And it ties into the last sentence. Once I understood that wholeness is not about perfection, but that brokenness actually and devastation that comes from that is a seedbed for new life. And you see the difference between having problems in your life that are a constant interruption that you want to push away and the recognition that the Jessica stories in our lives, whatever the Jessica story is for you, the Jessica story in your life is in fact a seedbed for something new to come up. Because the gospel is about this strange interplay between death and life, between joy and sorrow, between a cross and redemption, between wrath and forgiveness, right? That's the, that's the great tension of the gospel. It's all these juxtapositions. And so the, those of us with Jessica stories in our background as leaders, we can actually see that, as, as I did for so many years, as an interruption to my leadership, or we can see as a seedbed for new life. And I'm a totally different person than I was 25 years ago. Totally different. Because I have a Jessica story. Now, please notice, I'm not imputing that to God. I'm, I'm not saying, well, God knew what he was doing when he gave us Jessica. I'm not saying that. You know, God didn't wake up one morning and go, hmm, that Rod Wilson, he needs to learn some lessons. Okay, boop, there we go. I'm not, that's not what happened, okay? So, and we need to be careful with that kind of theology of imputing intentionality to God in areas where he works. He's taking the brokenness and the frailty and the wholeness of our lives and using that for good. And out of that devastation can come a seedbed for new life. And lastly, if I am competent, I will elevate authority and downplay biography. Those of you who've learned to preach and learned a little bit about homiletics uh, will know when you're younger, you know, and you could actually write in your notes, you know, weak point, yell here, you know, that kind of thing. You, you, you ever had that experience just when you started teaching and preaching and you knew you're, you know, and you got to that section, you were a little bit, eh, not so sure, I'm not so sure they like it, and, and you start speaking like this, and you're, oh, got your arm out, you're, oh, all this authority stuff, right? And my experience with people who, who over-embrace authority is it often reflects inadequacy in biography, right? They feel frail. They feel, they feel so broken. Have you noticed that about control freaks? Those of you who work with controlling people, don't look around the room in case they're here, but those of you who work with <laughs> controlling people, uh, you may have noticed the experience that controlling people often are the most insecure people going. And the way they cope with their insecurities, they control everything, and they go into authority, and I speak like this, and you often wonder when they go to bed at night and say good night to her, whether they say good night, dear. Like, like, speak English. Like, just talk normally. But it's this authoritative voice. How are you? I'm Pastor Dave. How are you? Like, like, just talk like a person already. What is your problem? Like, don't talk like a pastor. Just talk like a person. And it's this embracing of authority in such a way that biography, the subtext is biography and story becomes slowly pushed to the side. And then you know why burnout occurs in leaders is they then believe that this is who they are. This is who they are. I'm the, I'm the pastor. I'm the pastoral leader. And I even walk like a pastoral leader. I talk like a pastoral leader. Well, biography's gone. There's no more biography. There's no more story. Frederick Buechner, in a powerful way, in a powerful way, expresses this in his book, Telling Secrets. He says, ministers run the awful risk, in other words, of ceasing to be witnesses to the presence in their own lives, let alone in the lives of the people they're trying to minister to, of a living God who transcends everything they think they know and could say about him and is full of extraordinary surprises. Instead, they tend to become professionals who've mastered all the techniques of institutional religion and who speak on religious matters with what often seems a maximum of authority and a minimum of vital personal involvement. Their sermons often sound as bland as they sound bloodless. 
The faith they proclaim appears to be no longer rooted in or nourished by or challenged by their own lives, but instead free-floating, second-hand, passionless. When you have a Jessica story, you don't need to have our Jessica story. Okay? I keep repeating that because I want you to hear that. You don't need to have our Jessica story. But when you have a Jessica story in your life, one of the things you realize is that this is not about, all about authority and speaking from a distance with no biography. It's a recognition that you, when you have a Jessica story, you can't have a faith that's free-floating, second-hand, and passionless. You can't. You know, we talk about trusting God with our lives. I've talked about trusting God with my life and prayed for God. You know, God will use us and protect us and all the rest of it. It's very, very different when you know there's a person with an actual name who loves guns, who doesn't live very far away from you, who might kill you. It's a very, very different experience of the protection of God. And in your Jessica story, whatever that might be, I suggest to you, and again, I'm not taught, this is not a, a course on homiletics. Okay, so I'm not saying share all of this on Sunday morning. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about our own self-understanding, our own pastoral identity as leaders. When you have a Jessica story back here and it informs your life, you don't go into a maximum of authority at a minimal of vital person involvement. You recognize that it's in the brokenness of that that you feel the frailness and the dependence and the lack of self-reliance and you lean into who God is and to who Jesus is and you serve out of that. So the town of pain can be a real problem, but its potential for good is massive. Amen.